Okay, so this time we'll have a special. chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. First Samuel 13. Uh-huh. Samuel. of into the swing of our series on biblical worship and looking at worship. I wish everyone could have been here this morning, really. Uh, Charlie uh, Charlie preached my message on worship, or he tried to, but he was careful not to draw any specific or clear application. So, it was uh, fortunately, fortunately, it wasn't too much of a misdeed. <laughs> Uh, can I give some advice to everybody here, aside from the don't go back to school shopping? Sure. Pick on Charlie. No, don't do it. It'll make you feel good in life. It just There's something about that service that he provides for 100% of the people that know him. Uh, that just makes your life wonderful. So, another that's tip number two this morning. I feel like I should be getting tips for my tips. Anthony and I have this deal whenever I offer him advice and it's particularly good, I ask him what it's worth. And then he puts a dollar amount on it and we put it toward the amount of money that he owes me for all the advice. I'm like up to I think eight or nine hundred dollars right now in nice. advice. You know, like two dollars at a time. So I told Anthony yesterday, I said, I'm better than YouTube because I'm intuitive. And YouTube doesn't really know what you get or don't get. And it doesn't just pop up and tell you stuff unless you click on it. But whether you want it or not, you'll get it from me. And you're so, a real person. <laughs> yes, personally. So. Yeah. All right. 
I'm going to stop clowning because <clears throat> the matter that we have before us here this morning is key. Uh, it's key to really having meaningful worship in your life. And it's key to doing things that matter. Have you ever heard someone use the phrase, do what works for you? Yes. Worship isn't that way. I'll just tell you this morning, worship isn't you know, what works for you. Worship is really finding out what works for God. Yeah. And because of that, so many approaches to worship are so diametrically opposite from what, first of all, we're impressed are the methods and purposes of worship. And we just get it wrong. It's something that we really get wrong. Worship is also something which is uh, emphasized too much and I think in the wrong way or too little. But worship is what we are made for. If you don't understand worship, can I kindly say to you that you don't understand why you live? You don't understand your purpose? What did God make you for? I yesterday had some Jehovah's Witnesses uh, in my neighborhood and they of course spent a good bit of time at my house. And uh, they came by yesterday morning, a couple of nice ladies. And in the past, my policy generally is don't speak to Jehovah's Witnesses because they're trying to waste your time. And uh, But um, I have also really uh, seen a lot of young Jehovah's Witnesses. And as I get to be more of a geezer, uh, I, I guess I have a little bit better rapport when I tell somebody to be quiet and listen than I did when I was younger. And so yesterday I did. I, I was polite. I didn't say be quiet and listen like that. But I did kind of say be quiet and listen. I said, you asked a question, and I'm answering your question. So they knocked on my door, and a, a, a little boy was there uh, with his mother. And he was told to ask me, do you believe in eternal life or life after death? It's basically what you're saying. Do you believe that there's a resurrection of the dead? Is what he asked me. And he didn't quite know the terms. He stumbled at it and said like two or three different ways while his mother was coaching him. And then uh, I, I, so I said, well, what do you mean? Which death do you mean? You know, and he said, well, I mean death. And the mother said, death, I mean death. I said, well, the Greek word, because they like to tell you your Bible's no good, you know, so I just always go Greek on Jehovah's Witnesses. And so, so the Greek word, is thanatos for death. I mean separation. So which kind of separation? Spiritual or physical? And uh, so then the lady quoted John 3.16 to me, which I appreciated. I said, well, let's go to John chapter 3. And we uh, went through the gospel for a while, and I answered the question, do you believe in life after death? There's no such thing as she, if she's talking about spiritual there's no such thing as spiritual life without birth. And so we talked about birth, being born again. And, uh, and we talked about, you know, some other fun things. But uh, a couple of issues, a couple of times when we were trying to have discussions, we were, instead of looking at what the Bible said, the response many times was, well, let me give you a scenario. And I'll be quite frank with you, I'm not very interested in scenarios too often. My wife will tell you I'm much better about this because I, I illustrate some. But I, early in my ministry, I scratched illustrating. Just don't use an illustration. I understand that illustrations are helpful and they help you to understand truths. Uh, mostly I illustrate just to, for a distraction because you all get bored and fall asleep. So I tell a story <laughs> and then you come back for a while. Uh, but... The illustration, sometimes you can see a light come on when you illustrate something. You try to tell somebody a truth, and they don't necessarily possess logical faculties. And so, instead of uh, just understanding the truth, you have to illustrate it, so then they get it. I just insulted everybody. And Brother Charles is laughing about it, but nobody else is. So. Anyway, uh, the reality of it is, is that my wife used to tell me, well, illustrations are good, and so forth, and I used to try not to because it seemed like people oftentimes go away from a message and they remember the illustration, but they don't remember the Word of God that was illustrated. And there, there of course, needs to be balance in everything, doesn't there, as believers. And uh, so, 
one of the things that I realized, though, in a conversation with those, those individuals yesterday was that they were more concerned with being able to relate to God than they were with con concern with being able to find out who God was in actuality. Let me explain it this way. Uh, they told me that the righteous are going to inherit the earth, so God's not going to destroy the world. Well, we happen to be in 2 Peter. Uh, we were looking at the Scripture in chapter 1, so we went to chapter 3. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, we saw that scoffers in the last days are going to say, where's the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, everything is continued. You know, the clock winder theory before the brilliant man came up with it. Uh, though the, everything is continued, God set things in order, but where is God? What's He doing? There's, there is no impending doom, no judgment. God's not going to judge or destroy the world. And then Peter just specifically under the uh, influence of the Holy Spirit said that the day is going to come when the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. Now everything's going to pass away with a great noise and the whole world is going to be just destroyed. Yeah. Now they don't accept that. And the reason they don't accept that is because it doesn't appeal to them. We went to Revelation 20 and looked at the old heaven and the old earth being destroyed and God creating a new heaven and a new earth. And I don't know why a perfect world is not more palatable to people uh, than this sin-cursed earth. But there are many individuals who are convinced that there's nothing wrong with the world. They're convinced that this world's just fine. Now, is there beauty in this creation that God has made? Oh, yeah. yeah. There is, because God made it. But it's cursed, my friend. You can remove man out of this world and it will continue in his cursed decline. Because it's cursed. And God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And that's the truth. Amen. So we're going to come back next week. And I'm going to be in Michigan. <laughs> and talk to me about the earth, whether it's going to be destroyed or not. And you know something, my friend, what I realized in talking to them is they told me, they said, God cannot destroy the earth because the earth's good. They said that, you know, they quoted Psalms, and they said that uh, the righteous are going to inherit the earth. And so we went to Romans 3, and we saw that there is none righteous. No, not one. And they said, well, that's not, they said that Psalms is literal, but Romans isn't. So we couldn't ever get to how to be righteous. And they said that it isn't right for God to judge people and say that any that certain people are I said, are some people not righteous? Yes, some people are not righteous. And then I asked, have you ever sinned? Oh, well, is the Bible true here? Yes. Well then you're unrighteous. I'm not unrighteous. It's a little tough to wrap your mind around, but what it is is truth which works for me. So it's my convenient truth. And I fear, my friend, that not only people who develop cultish false doctrines are into their convenient truth. I fear that the church, saved, the saved church, is full of individuals who will only embrace truth convenient for them. And I use the word truth, the term uh, loosely, not accurately. The word truth means that it emanates from God. It really is. This is true. It has been true. It is presently true and it will always be true. That's the way real truth is. But what I'm talking about is my truth or your truth. That is truth that is what we embrace as true. What we acknowledge as truth. Which doesn't make it true or untrue at all. It simply means that it's what's convenient for us. And friend... The church is full of convenience when it comes to what we believe. Matter of fact, there are folks that consider themselves hardline extreme Christians, and there are selves that would consider themselves uh, more on the softer side of things, and both of them have their convenient truths. Yeah. Both sides have their convenient truths. This is what I believe, and this is the way it is, and the way it is for me, and it's the way it should be for everybody, and that's my truth. And this person's like, this is the way it is, and that's the way it should be, and this is the way it should be for everybody, and this is my truth. And my friend, if it, if it isn't true, it isn't. So I think in our preaching, we need to have more emphasis on truth and less emphasis on the package that it's presented with. 
I tire a little bit. I'm pretty high in energy today, so I could indulge it somewhat. But generally speaking, I tire a little bit uh, with people uh, saying things like, it isn't what you said, but it's how you said it. That's a phrase that's frustrating for me because truth is truth. And it is true, isn't it, in the Scripture that the Bible says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. The Bible... Or, uh, the Bible indicates that in several ways. That truth is in love. And that our, our speech ought to be gracious. And there are individuals who take a great deal of pride in being ungracious. Uh, and being nasty about truth. And being obnoxious about it. And that's godless. Yeah, even that, though that may, be, that may appeal to some of us. How many of y'all kind of like people being just a little bit obnoxious? It kind of appeals to Yeah, okay. Yeah, me too. I generally speak, a lot of us do. We just kind of get a kick out of the obnoxious truth. And that isn't the way it's supposed to be either. And so, uh, let's look today. I want to look at worship. And I want to just uh, be, first begin by reading just a text this morning. And this is just one of the examples of fallacies in worship. But uh, verse 8 of First uh, Samuel 13 We'll read it, and then we'll ask the Lord to really help bring us into focus about worship specifically here this morning. This is speaking of Saul waiting for Samuel, and uh, the Bible says, and he tarried, means to wait a long time or wait for him, tarried several days according to the said time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, <coughs> and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, bring hither all burnt, a burnt offering to me and a peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering and it <clears throat> came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. Now let's stop. Father, please help us today. Help us with our comprehension. Help us with our hearts. And Lord, <clears throat> help me uh, to be able to be clear uh, as we preach the Scripture this morning so that we can understand the importance of true worship. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we, def we defined worship. If you weren't here, the simple definition for the word worship, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, really every application of it, is to simply bow down. To bow down. And we talked about how opposite a lot of worship is. A lot of worship is this versus this. And when a person really sees God for who He is, he sees himself as well for who He is, and he bows down. You know, it, it really ties in with, and this is of course the reason that we had the order in our messages, it ties in with what we were looking at when we were talking about biblical separation. And a good illustration of worship and really uh, what happens when a person does worship is what happened to Isaiah when he saw God high and lifted up. And he saw uh, God's the, the holy presence of God in the temple with the seraphim flying around and smoke uh, just pouring out of the place. And then the seraphim crying out saying, Holy! 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 And the pillars in the temple shook. And this terrible presence of God who is high... Isaiah's response when he saw God for who he was, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone. And being undone caused him to bow down. Literally couldn't lift himself up. Couldn't stand up. Literally just collapsed. And that is the idea of bowing. Bowing isn't uh, <laughs> the Latin word genuflect. How many of y'all know what genuflect means? Well, you, you grew up in, uh, in Catholicism, probably, if you do, but, uh, or, or some type of Protestant imitation of Catholicism. And, uh, but it's bowing or bending, bending the knee. But the reality of it is, is that bowing is not just bending your knee. Bowing is on your face before God, literally unable to look up at Him because of the realization of self-unworthiness in His glorious presence. Now, when we worship God, we come to God with an offering. It's interesting in our context of what we read here this morning, it's interesting that you really don't see worship ever happening 
without some type of an offering. You ever, do you ever notice that? Could you give me an in instance where an individual came to God to worship without bringing something to offer God? Cain? Cain? Well, he offered something. God didn't accept it, but he offered it. There isn't an example, is there? There is never a time when one worships God without offering something. And therein is fallacy number one of worship. Individuals oftentimes will leave the service, though they may not be impolite enough to say it this way, oftentimes individuals leave the worship service saying, I didn't get much. When worship is giving, you're not getting and it's a fallacy of worship. I didn't get much today. Well, I appreciate that brother so-and-so offered that special, but I didn't get much from it, to be honest with you. Well, you know something? I know Pastor is you know, on his little hobby horse topical uh, series that he's on, or he's, he just is dead set on preaching through Job, but I'm not getting much from that. Worship isn't getting. Worship is offering. It's giving. Probably, few of us on a regular basis come prepared for worship. Because we aren't thinking about what we're giving. Do you know that just in society we're more polite than that? If I invite you to dinner, you say, Yes, thank you. What should I bring? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. He's not even kidding either. That's the great thing about it. Okay. <laughs> if I invite a stranger to our church and they're serious about attending, they ask, What should I wear? I, I'm just telling you, almost every time I invite somebody to our church, they say, what should I wear? And they're not just being... Uh, I mean, there, there's a sense where you just don't want to stand out. By the way, does this stand out or what? <laughs> right. Yeah, seriously. I'm 40. i got to give you one. Right? I'm embracing old man. I'm going to stop showering. I'm going to start wearing liniment combined with cologne. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. no. We're not going that far. But... <laughs> I shouldn't be joking when we're talking about worship. Let's get back on track. Uh, when I invite someone to church, they say, what should, I, what should I wear? And a lot of times they say, you know, can I give you something for the offering for the church? I'm going to just invite someone to church. And they, well, I don't, I, I'm going to come, but can I give something to the church? In other words, there is a sense in many individuals that don't even attend church that you should bring something. But we regulars don't feel obliged in the same way, do we? I'm not picking. I'm not, I'm not trying to say, you know, you need to bring more. You need to bring worship. What I'm saying is that if you came to worship, you came to offer something to God. Not to get something. Many people, what, well, what, what do you have? What do you have for kids? What do you have for teenagers? What do you have for adults? What am I going to get? That isn't worship, is it? No, I'm not saying that the church shouldn't give. I'm not saying, am I that God only is a taker? Would that be true of God? Who's a greater giver? Any of us? Or God? <clears throat> Who gave the most? Is there a comparison with that? No. But worship is not getting something. Worship is giving something. And that's a fallacy in worship. It's something that's not true that people believe. And they want to say, you know, what kind of a worship service... And then they'll say things like, I really love thus and so church because I get so much. 
out of the worship service. The question, because it isn't bad to get something, you ever give something, get something when you get it, when you give it? Mm -hmm. Is it true that it's more blessed to give than to receive? Yes. Is it true? It's yes. true. It is. I'm just telling you something. Let me give over getting any time as far as what I get from it. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. All of us, to some degree, like to get things. It's touching to me when somebody gives me something. It just it just says that this person loves me and they care about me. And it just you know, it isn't even what's given. I always appreciate what's given, but it isn't what's given so much as it is that they love me. And they want to give something. They just, I'm just telling you, just like, wow, man, that's wonderful. But when we worship, we don't worship so that we can get. We worship because God's worthy of worship. Mm -hmm. Or he should have something from me. He should have my worship. And he's going to get it. You see it? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, this is part A, so we'll probably have some more fallacies of worship next week. But I want to illustrate... Uh, some fallacies about worship. And the second fallacy about worship, really, <coughs> that I want to specifically illustrate is the notion that we can worship how we please. We can worship how we please. The illustration that we read, first of all, was Saul. And this is the famous story of King Saul, where he is in a real mess, actually, not of his own choosing. <coughs> he has been made chosen by whom to be king of Israel? God. He's king of Israel by God's choice. God wanted Saul to be king of Israel. And he's in a situation, if you read about it, where his son Solomon had a thousand guys that followed him, and they were basically warriors. And he had 3,000 guys with him because he's the king that followed him. And Jonathan, I love Jonathan. Anything you read about Jonathan in the Bible is just awesome. I'm telling you, Jonathan was a man. He was a great man, a good man, a godly man. And I'm telling you, he embodied everything a man ought to be. Jonathan was that guy. And so Jonathan went to the garrison of the, Phil garrison of the Philistines. You know what garrison is? It's a place where soldiers are posted. It's like an outpost. It's a place where soldiers are posted. <laughs> And Jonathan went and whooped up on the Philistines' garrison. Went and wiped it out. Okay, now, the, the, if you read in the passage a little bit about it, you'd read that there are only two guys in Israel that had swords. Jonathan had a sword, and Saul had a sword. And everybody else had, like, plows, you know, plowshares and, like, hand tools. And they had a file to sharpen their hand tools. And for anything major, they had to go to the Philistines and get their tools sharpened, and the Philistines didn't allow anybody in Israel to have swords. And it makes it all that much more admirable to me that Jonathan went to a garrison, which would have been probably at least a hundred Philistines, and I seriously doubt he took his thousand. He probably did it the way that he did with his armor bearer one time. He said, let's go to the garrison of the Philistines, the two of us. And the two guys went and took out a garrison of Philistines. That's Jonathan. So Jonathan went, they're not supposed to be under the thumb of Philistines, they're supposed to be ruled by God. And so Jonathan, as a deliverer, went and fought the Philistines, wiped out the garrison, and made the Philistines angry. So Saul had trumpets blown all through Israel that said, hey, everybody, come on. Uh, we're about to be attacked by the Philistines. You don't want to die in your fields. You better come and fight. Everybody comes. And Samuel said, I'm going to meet you in eight days, Saul, and <clears throat> then we're going to offer a sacrifice to God. <coughs> And Samuel didn't show up. And Saul has these people that have gathered around him and they're getting restless. Uh, Israel's not used to having a king. Israel's not used to... I mean, people are used to doing what's right in their own eyes the way we've seen in Judges. They're not accustomed to being told, you have to come and you have to fight. And some of them are packing up. And they're starting to go home. And the Philistines are over here and the Israelites are here and Saul's not doing anything because he's waiting on Samuel to offer a sacrifice and to hear from God. And while they're waiting for God, people are getting restless and they're starting to leave. And Saul has got a real problem. He's the king. He's supposed to lead these people. And Samuel's not showing up and Saul's in a real pickle. And so he needs to do something. He's trying to get people, hey, so you know what he said? He said, bring the sacrifice. Bring it. And they brought it and he offered it to God. Did the sacrifice need to be offered? 
Did it need to be offered? It's not a trick question. Think. Yeah, it did. It did. It did. Did Saul feel as though Samuel was derelict? He wasn't doing what he should have been doing. Well, Lord Samuel's supposed to be there, and he's not there. Yeah, I agree too. And so Saul, Saul said, "Somebody needs to do something." And you know, a lot of times people do need. Somebody does need to do something. I hate that phrase, don't you? Somebody needs. To, I hate when somebody tells me somebody ought to. It's like, go do it, man. Don't tell me that. If it needs to be done, you do it. Don't just, what you're telling me is I have to do it. You know, if you see it and it bothers you, go do it. But somebody needs to do something, and Saul's one of these guys that said, Well, we've got a problem here, and I'm just the man to solve it. But he wasn't just the man to solve it. There's never been a time when it's okay for a man to solve it. Let's look at another illustration. We'll come back here to 1 Samuel 13. But will you go with me to Leviticus chapter 10? So in, the, in your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. <coughs> This is really when God is establishing the law <coughs> with Moses and Aaron. And Aaron had two sons, Nadab and Abihu. They're all from uh, the tribe of Levi, and they're supposed to offer sacrifices. And in verse 1 of chapter 10 of Leviticus, the Bible says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense <coughs> thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which He commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And you read on, Then Moses <coughs> said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Uh, look at verse <coughs> 6. And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. <coughs> Excuse me. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. <coughs> They had the anointing oil of the word or of the Lord on them, and they were supposed to be in the in the in the temple offering sacrifice. And this is a pretty serious matter. Can you imagine losing your two oldest sons, being killed by fire in the middle of sacrifice? I don't know about you, but the day's over for me. But this is a serious matter, and God's taking it very very seriously. It's a matter of worship. And they're supposed to be offering an offering to God. And Nadab and Abihu decided we're going to offer something to God that he didn't ask for or that he didn't approve. Now, you and I oftentimes are offended at God when He doesn't approve of people's offerings. For instance, we've felt outrage, haven't we, on behalf of Cain sometimes? You ever just thought, you know what? I mean, Cain was a tiller of the ground. That's what he had, and so that's what he offered. He offered what he had. The problem was that it wasn't what God said to offer, and it didn't matter what he had. He could have offered what he was supposed to. We've given Cain so much benefit of the doubt, and God so little benefit of the doubt in that whole scenario, haven't we? You ever think about that? Man, we just, we've allowed that Cain, you know, he just offered what he, I've had heard people say that. I don't understand why God did that. You know, I just know that, you know, that's just the way God is sometimes. Why did God not offer, accept Cain's offering? He offered what he had. My friend, Cain could as easily, have as easily as anything gone to Abel and said, hey, trade you some vegetables for a lamb. It's not that complicated. Do you think Cain and Abel didn't have a barter system worked out? Sure. When did Cain kill Abel? Afterward, when they were in the field talking together. I mean, these guys worked side by side. They were in the same place. I'm certain that Abel probably ate vegetables ever so occasionally, don't you think? Yes. I'm pretty certain that Cain ate uh, uh, of something <coughs> that was slaughtered ever so occasionally, don't you think? Mm -hmm. They probably had the same diet. And Cain could have as easily offered the right sacrifice to God as Abel did. 
but he didn't want to. He wanted to offer a sacrifice that he liked to God. He didn't want a bloody sacrifice, but the life of the flesh is in the blood. And the blood is the illustration that that there is death and that the ultimate sacrifice is the sacrificial lamb of God. And it's not a sacrifice unless there's blood. There's no, there's no death and it's not effective unless there's death because as Hebrews explains to us, uh, a will or a testament is no good while the testator is alive. You have to be dead in order for it to go into effect. You know, and a sacrifice really isn't complete unless there's a death involved in it. And vegetables don't die. I don't want to get in an argument there. I'm not being silly. Cain offered what he wanted to God, and God said, that isn't what I require. Now, friend, listen to me. One of the fallacies of worship, we, we glanced on it last week when we saw the woman at the well, and she, before she uh, came to Christ in faith, said, the Jews say we have to worship in Jerusalem, but our fathers worship in this mountain. And Jesus' answer to her was, God is a spirit. So yeah, God's in the mountain. But then He said, they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. He said, the day is coming when you're not going to worship at Jerusalem and you're not going to worship in this mountain. But right now, the truth is, God said, worship at Jerusalem. So you're wrong. That was Jesus who said that. Friend, listen to me. A fallacy about worship is that we can worship God how, when, and where we please. And if God says it isn't worship, and if God says it is worship, only what God says is worship is. Do you get it? See, that's where we started off by saying, hey, listen, truth, not your truth, Cain's truth was that God should accept this. The Samaritan's truth was that God ought to accept this. But the real truth was that God is gracious to accept anything from us. And He'll only accept what He says is worship. The church today, my friend, believes that worship can be whatever we want it to be. Don't we? I didn't say don't they. I said don't we? We believe that worship is whatever we want it to be. And my friend, that's never been true about God. It's never been true about God. The worldliness in worship today, for a person that has ever gotten a glimpse of the holiness of God, is astonishing. It's blasphemous. I'll be frank with you. If I attend the preaching service of a contemporary church because I can't find another one around or something like that, I skip the whole worship part. I just don't go to it. Because it's blasphemous. It's worldly. It's the world's fleshly desires being fulfilled and it being channeled or being told this is worship. You say, Pastor, I don't agree with that. Well then why do, we, why do we congregate around genres of worship? For instance, these, these are laughable to me, they're comical in a sense, but the whole churches that have an identity around something that isn't Jesus gets me a little bit. For instance, Cowboy Church. Listen, if you go to Cowboy Church, I guess I am picking on you, I'm not trying to, okay? But if you go to Cowboy Church, the reason people go there is because, you know, well, we're Christians, but you know, we really want to be around cowboys when we worship. Biker church. We're Christian, but you know, bikers are Christians too, and we just want to worship like bikers. You know, we want to be around bikers when we worship. And then the musical genres of worship. This is our worship style. That's why we go. And churches will describe the style of their music and they will tell you what their musicians emulate in relation to a worldly artist. This is the style of our worship music. My friend, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And if it's a worldly style, I can promise you it is not worship. And God may not be striking you dead, but it's not an offering. Any more than Cain's offering. You say, does God always strike people dead? Well, let's go back to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13. I want to ask you a practical question. What was the difference between Nadab and Abihu's offering? There are some differences. But what are the differences between Nadab and Abihu's offering, Cain's offering, and Saul's offering? What? Was Saul's offering commanded? Yeah, not to him, but it was commanded. In other words, Nadab and Abihu were in the temple and they had been consecrated for the offering. In other words, they were yeah, they offered something different. The fire was wrong, the incense was wrong, but they were supposed to have fire and incense. So it was wrong, it was the wrong one. But in my mind, I see the difference between being the office of Nadab and Abihu. They were the ones who were supposed to offer the offering, right? They were they were the priests. They were performing the duty they were supposed to perform, but they casually, haphazardly said, "Hey, this is, let's do this. Let's do it this way." That's what they did. Cain's, Cain's offering was very similar, wasn't it? Let's do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. Right? And Saul's offering was, I'm going to do it this way. Wasn't it? Of course, I think that probably convenience factored into all three. Don't you think? Yeah. I think convenience factored in. Look at the woman at the well and the Samaritans worshiping at the top of the mountain. Don't you think convenience was a factor? It absolutely was. But God didn't kill Saul. And I find that interesting. Now we could say the severity, you know, Nadab and Abihu should have known better. Would you like to apply that to King Saul? Really, there's no difference, is there? Okay. The reason I want to mention this, the reason I want to point it out is that you may say, well, Pastor, you know, if worship's not terrible, then God, or if worship is, is unacceptable to God, then God will just kill you. And if that's your standard, <clears throat> it's kind of hit and miss, first of all. It's a little, it's a little bit dangerous. Like, I'm going to try, and as long as God doesn't get really ticked off, you know. And it misses the whole point, doesn't it? Of worship is what God says it is. Or have somebody try to pawn off something on you other something different than what you either ordered or what you expected or what you paid for. You ever order something and you got something else? It happens, doesn't it? Is that okay? Is it okay with you? I mean, unless they send something a lot better, but they usually don't, right? You know? Yeah, you brought your car in for an oil change, but we decided to replace the transmission. Here's your bill. <laughs> Is that okay? No. Well, I know what we said was, but you know, as I started looking at it, I realized what you really needed was... No. I want what I paid for. I want, I want what we agreed to what we expect here. Worship's offered that way, isn't it? Well, God, I know this is what you said, but, you know, the century in which we live. We don't really do that kind of thing anymore. That's a little bit stodgy. That's a little bit old-fashioned. <clears throat> We're fashionable. Now listen to me. The notion <coughs> that genres or ways can never change 
this is not necessarily true. We have to be careful about changing worship. At the very, can we agree on that? Can we say that worship ought to be something we ought to be really careful with? We ought to just be careful with it. We ought to be very, very deliberate. We ought to be very, very knowledgeable about what we're doing. It shouldn't be... I, you know, I really, I really like this. I don't really think worship should be done that way, should it? Now, I'll be honest with you. Some things have ministered. Some things have resonated. And you say, you know something? We got that right. And that's what, the way we're going to do it. Well, that's one thing, isn't it? It's a whole other thing when it's just like, well, let's try this. Well, let's try that. Or, you know, there's, there's something new. There's an idea I had. Or everybody is doing. And that's the way worship is. We have conferences on worship which have nothing to do with what God requires or what God expects, but they have everything to do with what's the latest and greatest idea and what will get people involved and what will make people happy. God's not into that. God doesn't want that, my friend. And I don't have to speak for God. He speaks for Himself. I know God doesn't want that from what He said. Okay, so here we are in 1 Samuel 13. Verse 11, Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. <coughs> Saul said, I was at Gilgal, the Philistines gathered in Michmash, and they are going to come. They are on the way. And I had not made supplication unto the Lord. Now, supplication is a asking kind of a, of a thing. It carries with it a uh, request. It says, I hadn't done business with God. Do you think it was important for Saul to make supplications unto the Lord? Sure. Do you think it was important for him to just offer himself to the Lord? Listen. <laughs> I'm not going to be. I'm not being silly about this. But if you're getting ready to die, you're bleeding out. What are you going to do? Pray. Before I meet the Lord, I'm going to talk to the Lord. Aren't you? I mean, honestly, if if I'm with somebody, I'm going to try to tell them something. Try to say something meaningful to them. And I'm talking to God. Make sure that I'm ready. You know, humanly speaking, Saul and this loose throng of Israelites following him, they're really way overmatched. And you have to admire the courage of people that say, this ought to be done so we'll do it whether we succeed or not. We're going to do it because it's right. And that's really Saul. And here Saul is making a good point. He's saying, Samuel, you weren't here. And I, if they came, if the Philistines came down out of the hills, we wouldn't have been ready to die. And it's a good, relatable, understandable point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I can totally understand it humanly speaking, except that worship, my friend, is not humanly speaking. Worship is talking about God and what God requires. And it is never about what a man thinks. It's about what God thinks. Isn't it so? And so Saul was rejected from being king because of it. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandments of the Lord thy God, which He commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. The Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. It's kind of a big deal. Saul didn't die when he offered the sacrifice, but Saul was rejected when he offered the sacrifice. We're going to end here today. We're going to look at 
further at Fallacies of Worship again next week. I, I wanted to get further, but we're not going to make it that far. But I want to end here today with us understanding something very, very clearly. Offer what you will, but God will not accept anything but what He wills. Listen, offer what you will, but God will not accept anything but what He wills. And God will reject the one who offers that which He does not will. My friend, it's more than just, well, we enjoyed that, but maybe it didn't resonate with God. It's God says, I don't want anything to do with you. And friend, I don't know the percentages. I wouldn't venture to guess. I don't know the heart of God. But that's most worship. <clears throat> most worship is man saying, here you go, God. I really like this. I hope you enjoy it. And God says, I don't like it. And I reject it from you. And so as far as worship goes, you didn't. I think in terms of waste, Effort, expense. Friend, I have to say to you, effort, expense, and time, there are things that God enables us to have in the short time that we live on this earth. And I think that most of it is just wasted when it comes to worship. <clears throat> if you offer something to God, and you put the effort into offering something that God says, I don't want. You wasted your effort. And you wasted the time that you offered it. And you wasted the expense of whatever it cost you to offer it because God doesn't want it. You order something and you get something you don't want and you don't need instead. What do you do with it? Give it back or throw it away. God orders worship and gives details. We'll look at details on how to worship. Gives details and we give Him something instead. What does He do with it? Gives it back or throws it away. Don't want it. That's for you, not for me. It's cute, isn't it, when a kid goes shopping for their parents? in the toy department. <laughs> Isn't it? <All> right. <laughs> I remember <laughs> my birthday. Oh, this is a lot of years ago now. But little Ben Wheelander, he would have been probably four, like four years old. And he bought me, he bought me a WWE wrestling belt for my birthday. I never even got to try it on <laughs> before he took it back. <laughs> And when he went home, he took it with him. Because his mom and dad said, get Pastor a gift, and he got Pastor a gift that he wanted. It's cute when a kid does that. And you kind of got to teach them not to do that, don't you? It's not cute when somebody who knows the Lord does that. Is it? There's really nothing cute about it. It's blasphemous, it's audacious. And it's offensive. But that's what worship usually is. Here you go, God. I got you something I liked. I'm going to try it on. See how it works for me. That, man, I'll tell you, that really, I really like that. Don't you like it? And the answer is no. Friend, worship. Worship is not to make God relatable to us. Worship is us realizing how unrelatable God is actually to us. It's us relating to Him, not Him relating to us. And it's just opposite that in practice usually, isn't it? That's it. That's as far as we're getting today in fallacies of worship. We're going to pray. Father, thank You for what we've learned today. I pray that You would help us to be convinced 
and to apply it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to dismiss the service in a minute. You may say, Pastor, it's unusual not to have an invitation. I want to be very deliberate in our service with what we're doing, and so I'll explain the invitation and um, give a little bit of help. Something I haven't mentioned in a while in, uh, at the end of our service, but something that's part of our regular invitation, you may even notice it in your church bulletin where it talks about the invitation in the service, and that's a matter of church membership. Uh, we have a number of folks that are new to our ministry that have not actually joined the church, and sometimes I think that that's more because we haven't mentioned it and nobody's thought of it. You may say, Pastor, I've been coming long enough. I feel like I'm a member. Well, I feel the same way about you, except uh, we'd like you uh, to just commit to being a member uh, of this local church. You know, the apostles always did that, and the believers in the church, first thing they did when they went to town was went and joined themselves to a church. And joining is not uh, casually attending. Joining is becoming part of it. And so uh, at the end of our services, every service, you, you pray if you haven't become a member of this church, you pray about being a member of this church. It is complicated. You have to be in doctrinal agreement, you have to be saved, and scripturally baptized. Those are what we require from you. Notice we didn't say we had to like your personality, or that you had to like our personality, or that you have to do anything else other than that, but if the Lord leads you to join our church, you're invited and desired to do so. We want you to be part of this local body. You say, Pastor, well, what practically, I'm not going to teach on membership, and so I just need to mention it. Uh, I'm not going to preach on membership. What practically does that do? Well, it obligates and commits you in a way that uh, is m more than just casual. For instance, did you know that a good church isn't just uh, run by an authoritarian pastor? This is not my church. Uh, if the Lord takes me, God will replace me. But this is you. The church is us. It's all of us. It's not me. I'm not the church. I've heard people say things like, "Get out of my church," or "You're not doing that in my church." Well, my friend, uh, there are things in our church that wouldn't be allowed because they're wrong. But it's not because of me. It's not mine. It's our church. And membership is ownership. Uh, membership is you being part of it. And so consider that if you haven't, uh, practically speaking, if you haven't become a member of our church. At the end of our service, uh, maybe next Sunday, maybe it'd be a good time for you to come forward at the invitation and say, I want to be an official member, a part of this church, and we'll just accept you, receive you into the membership. That's how complicated that is. Okay, that's the last thing I wanted to mention today. This evening we're going to be looking at part two of our message in Philemon. It's going to be a real help to you, so I hope you can come back tonight at 6 p.m., and I hope that as well you've been encouraged today about worship, that really you'd make this Lord's Day all about worshiping the Lord all day long. Uh, go with God's blessing and also go, uh, my friend, recognizing uh, that this is the Lord, day the Lord hath made. I'll rejoice and be glad in, in it. One of the things we're going to look at in a couple of weeks is individual worship, how to worship as an individual versus how to worship as in, in the church body. I think that will be a help as well. But you, uh, as, as the Lord leads, you worship Him today and uh, this week and go with God's blessing. Let's dismiss in prayer, shall we? Taz, would you dismiss us, please? Father, thank you so much for all that you've taught us, all that you've done for us. So, Lord, I just pray that we'll take this message of worship, the Lord, and apply it in our lives, not just here at church, but in our daily lives, as well as we go about our separate ways. Keep us safe, help us have a good afternoon, and be prepared to come back to church tonight. We'd ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.